Here. <laughs> Board Member Orgel. Here. Board Member Woods. Here. Board Member Love. Here. Board Member McCormick. Present. Board Member Avant. Here. Board Member Bibbs. Present. Board Member Cornell. Here. Chair Caldwell. Here. You have nine present. We have a quorum. Uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and uh, a, a moment of silence. And please keep uh, Ms. Brenda Allen and her family um, in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, she lost her sister. The question now is on the approval of the agenda. Are there any amendments? Seeing none, um, we are now ready. Uh, um, seeing no amendments, we are now ready to vote. Roll call, please. Board Member Jones. Are you here? I'm are you here okay with the agenda? Yes. Board Member Orgel. Board Member Woods. Here. Board Member Love. Aye. Board Member McCormick. Here and aye. Board Member Avant. <laughs> it's upon the approval of the agenda. Uh, uh, that was, I'm Board that Member Bibbs. Aye. Board Member Cornell. Aye. Chair Caldwell. <laughs> they are nine ayes. Thank you. The agenda is approved. So with that, we'll move on. Um, so um, just um, in my comment, I don't have very many comments today. Just, um, um, you know, we've gotten reports of the, of the academic achievement, and we are um, going to review that as a board. And it just uh, shows that we have work to do, but I think if we're all determined and work together, it's not, there's not anything we can't accomplish. Um, and if, I'd ask that if other board members have uh, uh, things they'd like uh, to speak about, you're certainly welcome to use the rest of my time. Seeing no lights, I'll pass it on to the superintendent. Uh, just very briefly, board members, and we do these KPIs, just to Mr. Caldwell's point. Um, you know, we've been reviewing the data uh, very closely, and um, the work is just so hard. I mean, we've spent a lot of time in, in schools over the last few weeks, and there's just such a huge transition that has to take place. A lot of adult learning, our teachers have to learn the standards and then figure out a way to impart those standards to, to children. And what we know and what you heard last week uh, and that we're, we're very cognizant of is that most of this hard work falls directly on uh, our teachers' shoulders. And I know that you all have been inundated with um, with uh, conversations from teachers. I know that you all have charged me to figure out ways to uh, lessen the burden to the extent possible. So uh, I met with the, uh, all the ILDs and the academic team uh, and charged them last week with coming up with some concepts that can take some of the load and some of the pressure off, off of teachers without compromising uh, their ability to learn new standards and teach them. So I uh, have some good preliminary recommendations, but I see Ms. Rucker out there uh, we're going to meet again on Friday. I've invited her to come and with some suggestions. But what we know for sure, our, our thinking is that when we hear the most is that um, the time that it takes to do the lesson plan template is just so long. 
And so, but I, but I do want to just say from my understanding, what happens is because these standards are so new, uh, there is some value in going through the lesson plan, doing the mental exercise of planning your lesson. However, uh, we think we have a way to do that for teachers. Uh, so that they don't have to spend that extra time uh, going through that. So we're going to be looking closely at figuring out how to um, um, take the lesson plan template off of their uh, shoulders, uh, help them with collaborative planning support, do more virtual training uh, so that uh, they don't have to actually go to uh, the TLA to get trained. They can view it on, on the computer. And then also we're trying to figure out if, if there's a way we can uh, offer a financial uh, stipend to teachers when they do go uh, to do the training. We're trying to work that out. But we think that uh, with our teacher partners and with um, our school leaders, uh, we can come up with something to lessen the burden. But having said that, board members, uh, you guys uh, have spent time with some of this curriculum. Uh, we're going to do a deep dive on Thursday in our academic review meeting and lay out our full academic plan and timing and all that. Uh, but, but there's no other way to grasp the standards and learn them except to learn them. And it's just going to be uh, it's just going to take uh, more work, but we are very cognizant of the impact that it's having on our teachers. Um, unless there are questions, I'll turn over to Ms. Lotz for. Board Member Cornell. Um, I, I think we need to understand what the teachers and the superintendent are going through in that. Uh, it looks like the state, after saying that we're not going to do Common Core, has now befuddled everyone by requiring mathematics be done in a very uncommon way. And so the superintendent, as an officer of the state, and, and all of us are supposed to follow what the state asked for. And uh, I think, Board Member Woods, I think we ought to come up with a policy and present it to the legislature as to what we think we do or don't like about what they're re requiring of us and and it's required because it will be they will be tested on the mathematical way of doing the math i would love to see some of those tests or some sample tests and see what they're doing the second thing is that um, and I'll, I'll when when you bring back your analysis I have a little analysis. Uh, if anybody has seen the TVAS equation, it's incredible. It's actually mystical. And I won't go any further, but I'm going to, I think the fact that they have put something like that on top of judging us is ridiculous. And so, you know, we ought to be allowed to go ahead and run the schools and educate the children. And what could imagine what we could do if the state actually laid off of us on, in some areas, let us teach math the way math needs to be taught, quit judging all the children based on mystical equations, and actually gave us the money we're supposed to get. So I want to thank everybody within hearing distance in the World Wide Web who's been helping our students that we are. It's like climbing a fence that it's leaning toward you. I'm sorry, Board Member Bibbs. I just wanted to say one quick point um, coming from Board Member Cornell. Hopefully that his former colleagues, because he serves so many years at the state level, actually are listening to him and paying attention to what's being said. So as we move into the next um, year in next legislative cycle, whoever has that task, I think let's all work with uh, Board Member Cornell around what that looks like to move forward with that. That, Ms. Pibbs, and also I'd say too, we've been talking about it, working with some of our teacher partners. We really need to do something about RTI because what happens is the state has a intervention model that assumes that three to five percent of your kids are tier three but we've got about sixty percent of our kids tier three and so the time that it takes to do the intervention and the pullouts on what's supposed to be a very limited amount of kids when you have to do that on the great majority of kids it also takes additional time out of classrooms and I, I applaud the state's effort for having a scheme to try to get 
kids who are far behind caught up. But when when the when the bell curve is shaped is, is upside down because of, of of some of the achievement levels of our students, uh, it just it's not practical, and it probably it probably hurts kids more than helps kids because of the amount of time it takes and also taxes teachers as they're trying to prepare their lesson, implement the new standards, do RTI. Uh, it's just, it's almost just not humanly possible. So I think that would be certainly something we're going to be asking the board to put on the uh, legislative agenda. Ms. Lots. I apologize, Ms. Avan has a right on. Sorry, just a quick question in response to Ms. Uh, Superintendent's um, remarks and, and Ms. Bibbs about the RTI. Would that not be an administrative function that the Department of Education would need to address? Would it need to be something? <coughs> this is a discussion for later, but I just wonder if when we're thinking about the things we bring forward to the legislative those things that could be administratively changed without having to actually change policy no, you, you, that's correct right. um, good afternoon everybody so our kpis for this month are all around priority three which is around developing teachers leaders and central office to drive student results so specifically what you'll see here are some indicators of teacher performance by tim score and observation ratings and then also the teacher vacancies on the first day of school uh, one thing you also note here is that we don't have yet the overall tim score uh, ready to provide for you i believe the state just released most of that tvos and achievement information to teachers on their scores this past friday so we should have it pretty soon but just not in time for this particular presentation so we're going to focus on observation ratings specifically <coughs> so in terms of key findings um, we've seen a pretty steady increase in observation ratings over time um, and that's at all three grade levels a little over two-thirds of our schools averaged uh, observation score 4.0 or above on a five-point scale this past year um, in terms of teacher vacancies we had 176 total on the first day of school but a little over um, Sorry, a little under half of those were um, open for 30 days or more. So here you can see the distribution of teacher observation ratings over time. The yellow bar and the dark blue bar show you the percentage of teachers that earned a level four or level five score. And at the top you've got the 14-15 school year and at the bottom you've got our most recent school year. So you can see those trends have been about the same year over year, but we've had a few, uh, uh, couple percentage points higher teachers getting a level four or five average in the past couple of years and if we just pause your board because I know that this is of important to you all because it's always when we talk about you know compensation and the teacher evaluation there's always this myth that there are so many teachers and evaluation is so you can't get fours and fives I think that this is 80 roughly 80 percent fours and fives and 93 percent threes fours and fives and it actually is going up so I, I just want to just flag that because I often hear as I'm out, teachers would talk about how the evaluation system is not fair and it leads to unfair results. But the data shows that, I mean, you're 80, there's an 80% chance of our 6,000 plus teachers that you're level four, level five. And it's just, and, it, and it's notwithstanding what the achievement data looks like, the TIM observation data, the trend is that the observation scores keep going up. So one other view of this is to look at the average observation score over time, and we broke this down by grade band. Um, so here you can see across elementary, middle, and high, uh, the, the average observation score has increased but from 14-15 to the 16-17 16, 16, school year. Um, and again, we had about two-thirds of schools uh, earn a, a school average of 4.0 or higher in this past year. I, I think Ms. Avan had a question. Mr. Orgel has a question too, so if you go ahead. So, Superintendent, maybe someone can explain because there's such a disparity in what we just saw as our TVAS scores, but we have TIM scores that show our teachers are fours or fives. How do we align the two? So, how is it for me, a lay person, to understand how the TIM scores could be so high for fours and fives? How does that apply to then what instruction looks like in the classroom with us having TVAS scores of you know the growth that we had this year is disheartening so it, it it's hard for me to reconcile the two um in how we as board members then take this information and then support you as the district from a fiscal standpoint 
So I think, Miss Avon, it starts with, because um, this is obviously something we've wrestled with for years, it starts with the TIM process, right? So what you basically are doing is within a snapshot of time, you know, 20 minutes or so, principals are walking in and they're, they have a rubric and they're trying to figure out is the teacher hitting the rubric. So the reality is, is that after doing it for a few years and somebody comes in your classroom, you just know how to hit the rubric. And that's not to undermine the wonderful teachers we have out there, but at the end of the day, you're basically saying, let's take 20 minutes, and I'm simplifying, take 20 minutes, and I know you're coming, and in these 20 minutes, can you do these things that you know I'm gonna be looking for? Mm -hmm. Now, the rub is for some of our schools, for some of our teachers, uh, the in tested subjects, the te their, their school scores are included in that, and that's a little different. So we're talking about the TIM scores. But what our data says is that all of our teachers are above or significantly above expectations. So I think that we have to start to think about, um, you know, should the root, and I know we hate this because we have a lot of back and forth with the, with the teachers well, anytime we change the rubric. But the question becomes, you know, is the rubric really a good definition of what good teaching is? Because when we started to work with the Gates Foundation, we said we want to start with a common definition of good teaching. And we're going to set that forth through this evaluation. Now, the flip side is, you know, six or seven years ago, some teachers would not get evaluated once every five years. So I think that somewhere between where we are right now, where we have a snapshot of time where you can really be rehearsed, versus not evaluating at all. We gotta figure out what the right measures are or, or look to multiple measures mm -hmm. uh, as we start to really try to evaluate teachers. And oh, by the way, it takes a lot of time on teachers. They have to prep for it. It takes a lot of time on principals. They go in there and spend all day and weeks and weeks and weeks evaluating all the teachers. And teachers are trained to hit the rubric. Well, I think the challenge for us is, or for me, I'm not gonna speak for the entire board. The challenge for me is, with the amount of time that it takes for principals to go in and make sure that effective teacher effective teaching is happening meaning that instruction is happening mm -hmm. and that they're covering curriculum in the time frame to meet those particular benchmarks but we're at a flip side now that we're saying our teachers are saying with the new standards how are we taking that information and then supporting them in the classroom that means that our, our not only are they doing effective teaching but that our kids are also making the types of gains they're making and one point to that miss avan so there our rubric now um does not have a way and correct me if i'm wrong dr griffin does not have a way to to measure content so you really are talking about as you're in the classroom are you doing these agreed upon things uh, which I would say we've got great teachers and they know how to do it and I think that once you've done it a few times so uh, you know at the end of the day um, you know we probably need to have some conversations about how do you integrate content into the evaluation and how do you change it to be more reflective but we didn't want to change this too no, as we I try know, to figure out how that. to and I, I don't think that's not yeah. that isn't my suggestion de definitely about changing the rubric but I think what we're saying is we've now saturated that we have effective teachers. I agree. I mean, we're saying that we've we've seen that over the last few years, the majority of our our teachers are four and five, fours and fives. We're at a different place now, where our teachers are saying that they need the support uh, in order for our kids to be able, for them to be able to grasp the content, and then for them to be able to teach that content. And we'll also, Miss Avon, provide to the board. I think the state does a report every year that highlights the rate of drift. Is that right? Like where they kind of look in and look at the alignment but for all the districts okay here's what your here's what your evaluations are saying here's what your achievement is and tries to make sense of all that so we'll, we'll share that with the board board member love um, I have a question superintendent so the Tim score um, is this reflecting the school and the student input for the TIM scores, is this, this is just the teacher? This is just the teacher part, the, the observation piece. Okay, so um, I'm going to jump off subject real quick. I'm coming right back. So when we talk about our uh, data that we have, um, our school data, I know that the principal observes the teacher. That's correct. And then the IOD observes the principal or works with the principal. Okay, so um, I know that I've asked for the district uh, non-negotiables because uh, I know that sometimes we base moving a principal uh, off of their data, right? 
So how do we base an ILD? Because if you have an ILD who is constantly at a school and you remove that principal because you say he or she wasn't effective, but the ILD is still there, um, how, how are we able to ensure that that ILD is doing exactly what he or she uh, was given the job to do? I think that's a great question, Ms. Levin, just in all candor. I think most of the ILDs have been around maybe four years, and this was the first year in looking at the data. I had questions about certain folks who weren't moving schools. And so in talking to Dr. Griffin, what she said was she wanted to at least have this year to be able to counsel folks and set the expectations, but we are looking at that. I mean, I think if you have, you know, what we usually do is a school, three to five years, three on the quick end, if there's been no growth or regression, then we look to look at the leader. So I think that, you know, four years as an ILD, if you have, if your schools aren't moving or you're not showing any progress, I think that that's the same process that we intend on doing this year. Okay, so, but I would like to see the non-negotiable, because I know we have them for our teachers, and I know we have them for our principals, but where are the non-negotiables for our district level administration? Um, and this will clear out a lot of, uh, I mean, well, this will clear the way for, to make sure that we're being truly transparent and we're holding everybody who uh, has it, an interest in our children accountable, not just the people who are employed inside the schools. Dr. Whitelaw, Dr. Griffin, can we make sure we get that information? Okay. And we, we at the academic meeting on Thursday, can we share it then? We will have, okay. Okay, so um, we'll go from here to, to some vacancy staffing information. Um, so as I mentioned at the, the top of the presentation, on the first day of school we had 176 teacher vacancies, and of those, a uh, little under half were open for um, longer than 30 days, so that might be expected. Um, you can see that there were, um, I'm sorry, I keep saying that backwards, um, but 84 were open for more than 30 days, but there were also um, more than half that were open for less than 30 days, and you can see that breakdown at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you benchmark the number of vacancies that we had identified since February of this year versus how many we had filled, um, we're pretty much on par in terms of fill rate for teachers and other instructional staff and school support staff, um, a little bit lower on central office hiring. So this is just a way to benchmark where we were. Um, but bear in mind we have um, somewhere in the ballpark of about 6,500 teaching positions. Um, and so of those, 176 were vacant on the first day. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think, Ms. Small, though, of those 176, many of them had certified teachers, whether they were teachers on assignments mm -hmm. or uh, excess teachers or, okay. Um, I, I had a question. I don't see any lights. Um, but this is more about interpreting this data and figure what's driving it. I looked at the previous slide. We actually incre increased the number of teachers that scored one. So if we ever, uh, and then vacancy, has, I think, also fall in line with this, if we ever looked at what may be driving that. I know we used to pay a bonus for teachers that had certain degrees, and I think we stopped that. And so with the competition uh, um, in such a small area, you know, it might be helpful to try to really start figuring, one, why, why we're not getting, um, you know, why we would be having more ones and then also um, dissect some of these vacancies to see, um, you know, um, are the, is, it, is it something that might be affected by if we were offered an incentive? Ms. Small, can you speak to some of the work around that that we've been doing? I mean, that's, and that's Mr. Caldwell, we've obviously been doing it internally, but as we wrap up our work with the Gates Foundation, that's, that's some of the work we've been doing with them too. Well, the only thing that I would add is, um, in fact, this year we are implementing our new teacher compensation system that does reward based on performance. Um, and I think, um, to your point, I think at that point we will start to see where if you come to work for Shelby County Schools and you are a high performer, um, that you are rewarded in a more substantial way as opposed to our low performers. Um, so, so the only thing I would add back, though, is um, we may not even get some high performers be because they're going elsewhere before we get here, before the, before anybody thinks about coming here. So that, I don't know. That's I don't correct. 
I mean, I, I think even at this point now, now that we have gotten past the first day of school, one of the things that we really, really start to take a deep dive look into is our exit information. Um, not only do we just routinely provide that exit survey to those who may be resigning or leaving the district, but at this point in, this, in the school year, we're actually in the process of calling folks who are resigning to figure out the reasons why and to see if we can um, develop strategies along in, in collaboration with our, our other departments such as academics to troubleshoot because I think last year what we saw was the number one reason teachers were leaving was because of compensation which is why it was so important to make sure that we implemented the new teacher comp plan and so what we would hope to see is a shift um, and that no longer become or be the number one reason as to why teachers were leaving. So we really do take a close look at that exit survey information to help determine the strategies that should be implemented. Uh, board Member Love. Chief Smiles, um, I can't remember the name of the program, but it was implemented through the state of Tennessee. Um, I called and asked you about it. I can't remember. It. But it was a program to help uh, certified teachers or to help teachers get certified it was a three-year program. It, anybody know what I'm talking about? Is it like the? I don't the, remember the name of the program, but you know there are um, the al alternative, alternative cert certification yeah. and licensure programs for teachers who did not, you know, um, go through a traditional teacher education prep program. Um, there are certain requirements that are in place that allow us to hi hire those teachers on a waiver or permit, um, as long as they have the necessary GPA. And they are allowed, I think they're given up to three years to go and complete that TEP program. So that's something that, you know, we do honestly utilize. I will say the state closely monitors that for us. They, they don't um, encourage us to hire a lot of teachers on waivers. But, you know, at, at certain points in the school year, we have principals that say, you know, I may have a, a wonderful education uh, or ed assistant at my school. They have their bachelor's degree. They have the GPA. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to work with that person. Can we go ahead and get that person in on a waiver? And we certainly help expedite that process. Okay. All right. So uh, final slide on vacancies or just around what subject areas uh, the ones on the first day of school were coming from. So here you'll see about 60, I think it's a three. Um, of our vacancies were in elementary. Uh, one thing to note on that is that's expected um, because about half of our students are in elementary school and that's about a third of the vacancies. Uh, the reason that you're seeing it uh, bear out that way is because you don't typically see all of the subjects being broken out in elementary the way you will in middle and high. So all of those middle and high school subjects are just divvied up on those other bars there. So any questions here? Okay, so I will close with um, a few of our recommendations. So I certainly want to continue to provide professional development and guidance to ensure that our evaluation practices are being administered with fidelity and that um, we're giving teachers really good feedback for the new standards in place. We want to continue to implement earlier uh, teacher hiring timelines and processes. There was a lot of work done this year with the budget team and with HR to move up our budget checkout process, identify vacancies earlier. And as part of that, we also gave some early notification incentives for teachers that knew they were going to retire or move on from the district so that we could identify more of those vacancies sooner to fill them. Oh. I don't see any questions. Okay. Uh, so for next month, we have uh, quite a few big KPIs to go through, and these will relate a lot to our 80-90-100 goals. So you'll see our four-year graduation rate, uh, the number and percentage of students graduating with professional certifications, and then achievement gaps and growth gaps based on our new 10-ready data. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'll move to staff action items, and I believe the superintendent may have a, a early childhood presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have a few items around early childhood, particularly um, the Head Start um, application, the volunteer pre-K grant from the state, uh, and some other items uh, that go along with those. And I know that you guys. I know the Policy Council discusses, I believe that Dr. McClendon discussed most of these issues with the board, but I, I wanted just for some context for her to do a quick uh, presentation around some um, data we have recently uh, received on our early childhood programs.
Good evening. We'd just like to give you some program highlights. Um, we've had a lot of uh, good things to happen in early childhood in our previous school year. One of the things that we're very proud of is 100% of our parents have received comprehensive services. And what that means is set up like the Head Start model. Each child receives a family service worker. We have family outcomes and things that we work with our parents on. And so each child in our program has uh, been fortunate enough to receive those, those comprehensive services. 49% uh, of our pre-K students have in entered kindergarten what we would call kindergarten ready according to our map assessment we know that our map assessment is um, the district assessment that we use to benchmark our students and so we know that about 49 percent of our children are entering kindergarten ready uh, we also uh, work on early literacy skills and how we benchmark our students on early literacy skills uh, 74 percent of those children showed on early literacy skills which are things like vocabulary uh, letter recognition that 74 percent of those children actually uh, were prepared we want to look at our data over time in 2014 we started out with about only 68 percent of our children uh, being proficient in what we would think early literacy skills and we can see that in 2016 we were at 74 percent and then again in 2017 we were only at 74 percent again but that still is something to be proud of because we started much lower this particular cohort last year started much lower than the 2016 cohort did and so they showed more growth over time We're required to give our students the Brigance data. The Brigance is an early childhood assessment. It tests things like gross motor, fine motor, language development, literacy, math, uh, self-help, and social and emotional. Those are all things that we think of in the early childhood continuum as being uh, school-ready skills. And as you can see, that at the beginning of our year, at the beginning of the year, our children come in uh, with lots of numerous challenges, and as the mid-year data shows, we grow over time, and then by the year end, we can see that we really put a lot of effort into it, and that our data has risen. Sometimes we look at data, we give a lot of assessments, but. One of the things that our program is required to do is we have an outside eva evaluator come in. I know you guys are very familiar with the Vanderbilt research study that a few years ago sort of talked about what types of things we were doing or not doing in early childhood as a state. Uh, Vanderbilt is coming in currently and doing some research assessments with our children just to see where are our children ending up compared to the rest of the state and amongst each other. So they went to about 95 early childhood classrooms. They selected randomly 900 children and they focused on areas like literacy, language, mathematics, and self-regulation. Uh, one thing that we're very proud of is we had the largest gains in the state on the PPVT the letter knowledge, the spelling, and the applied problems. And I know often uh, Shelby County Schools doesn't get to celebrate uh, being sort of at the top when it comes to our students and their ability to achieve. And we are able to demonstrate this in early childhood in that study. Um, how did we do against our counterparts here? in Shelby County Schools. As you can see, uh, SES is there, ASD is there, uh, and Millington is there because we all participate in the Shelby County Consortium. As you can see with the PPVT scores, uh, which is sort of a Peabody picture vocabulary test, uh, we scored very well as a part of that cohort. Letter knowledge, we also scored at the top of that cohort. And, and spelling, we did as well. Now we do want to know that compared to Metro Nashville, we made larger gains in all three of those particular areas. Although we need to lean in a little bit as far as our picture vocabulary and our spelling because the national average is 100 and we're at 94.5 and 94.3. In letter recognition, we scored 107. Uh, Metro Nashville Public Schools scored 105. Uh, for everyone in the consortium and in Metro Nashville schools, uh, we all made larger gains than we had in the 15-16 school year in 16-17. 
Another thing that we were very proud of, um, thanks to Mr. Hobson and the board, we were able to actually have a summer program to address what we think of as a regression or summer slide. Uh, we had about 760 pre-K students that had this particular opportunity. Uh, we were able to maintain about 86% of those students either grew or improved from having been able to attend that particular program. They were very immersed in literacy, numeracy, and STEM-related activities in that program. So we think we do pretty well academically, but how do our families think that we do? And one thing that we're very proud of, our families felt welcomed. They felt that they were satisf satisfied with our Head Start program. And they really felt like they understood the decisions that were made regarding their child's education. And so that kind of lends itself back to those comprehensive services. And so in general, families felt pretty good about their participation in our program. And that's important to us. And I just wanted if you have any questions. Uh, board member Avan. Well, congratulations, Dr. McClendon. Those are really, it's really impressive how our students have grown over the last year. And we know that that is a lot to do with your leadership and the folks who work very hard on your teams. Um, I did have a question about for the test that the Brigantz test, as well as if you could, how was this test administered? So teachers or teacher assistants actually sit one-on-one -on -one with children and they ask them a battery of questions and some of them also are observation notes. So when you look at social and emotional, you might think of, is a child able to get in line and stand patiently and wait? Uh, if someone else has a toy, do they know how to kind of redirect themselves and pick an additional toy? Gross motor, we know in early childhood, the biggest way children learn is through play. Uh, so they do have a lot of gross motor time. And am I able to skip and hop and jump? Because those, believe it or not, are factors that lend itself later on to do children show up with some sort of learning disabilities. And so that's the way we actually administer that Brigance assessment. So a question for um, superintendent and I guess um, thinking about this moving forward is how these scores help us relate better to where children are supposed to be as far as the first map assessment. So I would wonder if there's, if we've taken some time to look through the correlation between those students that were a part of the Summer Learning Academy for both pre-K and our 6,000 students that participated this summer, um, how they did on the first map. I know my daughter's been taking the map test for the last two weeks. So thinking about if there is a direct correlation between growth for those students that participated in the Summer Learning Academy and where we are for map scores uh, for the first map test. Yes, and we'll share with you, Ms. Ava. What happened was, I guess, for those, the, the Summer Learning Academy students, we kept track of them through the Achieve 3000, the, the I rating. So I think that what, what the, the plan always has been to take a look at them and look at the growth and we'll share that data with the board. Yeah, you have it. Okay. Well, and it'd be great if, if um, our co-chairs of um, academic achievement, if running it through their committee might be a good way to share that information back to us so that we can see whether, that, whether our return on that investment will yield us what we need for next year. Thinking about that for our budget for next year. I believe it was very positive too, so. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. Board Member Woods. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on the other uh, assessment, I think you mentioned it was I-Station scores. Uh, Superintendent, is the district still uh, using I-Station throughout all grades, or are we only doing that in the early uh, grades? We're currently only using that in pre-K. Our preschool development grant um, is funded as our match to, I'm sorry, our county commission grant is funded as our match to our preschool development grant. They wanted us to all in the consortium use the same assessment and they wanted us to have longitudinal data. So they are requiring that we continue with the I station. And so pre-K is the only grade level that utilizes that assessment. So to my, to my question, that means that beyond pre-K, will this particular, will this population continue to be tested with I-Station? No, but they do 
switched to MAP and we have seen a very heavy correlation between other assessments like MAP, PPVT, and other assessments that students are given and their I-Station data. So what constitute a longitudinal study uh, because you indicated that they're no longer going to be using I-Station uh, test scores so there is no correlation there. So uh, are you all part of it like today and but next year you won't be? So the preschool development grant will be an additional year and so although we are tracking our data over time for kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, we're required to see um, did the resources that we were given in the grant, did it make a difference in our actual achievement scores. So Superintendent, is the, is, are we able to, to use the, the assessment that you moved to, and that's the point I'm getting at, uh, for the pre-K population? Like there is an, so we, I take it we were using iStation, correct me if I'm wrong, we were using iStation, we moved to another uh, platform. Smarty Ants. And, uh, and so, uh, so even if there is a, a correlation there, it's still different. So is there a reason, in addition to the grant, and I guess it's more of a question to you, Superintendent, uh, and to, uh, your admin, uh, to your academics team, but should we not also assess them on what they're gonna be t assessed on in, be after they leave the pre-K programs so we can see if there's any drop off without guessing uh, if, if, if the testing correlation is there. I guess that's what I'm asking. So I asked that question too, Mr. Wilson. I think that, that you know, uh, to Dr. McClendon's point, I think the only reason we're doing the I station is just because we have to. Because we have to? Yeah, and I think the, the concern was if we did the other assessment too so we could have apples to apples comparison, it just would be another assessment. Okay, it'd just be another test that they have to take. All right, so I'll, I'll, my final comment there would be is that I hope that we don't feel, uh, Mr. Superintendent, that when we move to a particular uh, assessment model, if we determine that it's not the, the best tool, uh, that we are still willing to, to say, you know what, that's not working out because we continue to get feedback. I, again, regardless of what product we use, you're going to get some feedback from, uh, from your uh, at the school level, but um, there's still some some talk around whether or not you know moving from my station was a good idea or not. So I guess we'll we'll see that sooner or later. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Cornell. Yep, mine is a little bit along those lines too. Uh, now the I station is that touch screen. The way they take it, they actually can either touch or they can click. So the way it comes up are there are lowercase and uppercase letters and it would say pick out the letter B and the children would move their mouse there or they can touch the screen and click on it. All right, now when, when the kids go to kindergarten and they take tests in kindergarten, are they touch screen, screen or mouse? They do use the mouse, but the pre-K seems very much like a game. And when they get to kindergarten, it's a little bit less game-like and they will click, but we do use a lot of mouse practice because that would go back to your fine motor skills, uh, those pincher muscles and being able to click that are required in the brigands. So we do work through those. So do kindergartners who attend our pre-K Head Start, have, so do they actually have training to use the mouse so when they're in kindergarten, they can take the test without the fine those motor skills interrupting their ability to take the test or do you really think that maybe the kindergarten teacher is best at teaching them those skills for tests later in the year yes and most of the assessments that we use have something called mouse practice during the kindergarten so children of course who have attended some sort of early learning opportunity they're very fluent with computers those who have not there's a little practice that they can do with those particular assessments and even just some game things that teachers do uh, like ABC Mouse and other things that are available to them before they actually give them the assessment. Most teachers would do that to prepare their students for the assessment. Okay, but, but okay. The other question is, uh, what is the difference between language, what, in the definition, what's the difference between language skills and literacy? Because language skills are following motor skills, but literacy is not. What's the difference? So with language skills, when we think about language, we think about language arts. We're thinking about the writing. We're thinking about the reading. We think about the speaking. We think about the listening comprehension. All of those are considered to be language skills. When we talk about just basic literacy skills, 
We're talking about phonemic awareness, phonics, we're talking about fluency when we're reading. So those things are literacy skills, but if you can't do all the language skills, the language and the literacy go together sort of in one big pie. So, so we're, we're dealing with students who are actually achieving more language skills, but perhaps because there's half a million fewer words spoken at home they don't have the literacy skills yet is that scott riesling's research does tell us that sir okay now the van the vanderbilt study it's my understanding that after looking at pre-k vanderbilt peabody said we've got to find more but we got to dig deeper are we part of that digging deeper yes sir yeah. we are placing more academic rigor that is developmentally appropriate into our program. So the Vanderbilt study said two things. Um, a lot of rote memorization in early childhood seems to sort of kill a, a love of learning. And so are we using developmentally appropriate practices, but at the same time, are children getting what we think of as basic foundational skills, which means letter recognition, letter knowledge? Um, are you able to do basic things like write your name? Do you know your vocabulary when you're looking at a picture? Can you tell if that's a lion or a clown? So those are the things that Vanderbilt has really um, asked us to lean into as far as their research and the things that have come out. Yeah, I got one, one other question. I appreciate the board members letting me uh, dig into this. But just one quick question, that is, we had, we had uh, when we had committee, it showed, like you showed, I mean, you all demonstrated that there is a good 74% based on the federal parameters. And yet by third grade, the state's saying we're not at 74%. We, are we going to be setting up some sort of system or examining what, why that works that way? Is it, is it their tests are better than the state's tests? <laughs> So we have recognized that in the data, and Dr. Burton and I have uh, began to work through and think through a plan as to where we can incrementally do checks to see that our children are not losing ground. So what tends to happen in maybe around kindergarten and first grade, we don't do a lot of assessments, and so our children begin to lose ground. And so we're going to think through how to put in some formative assessments and benchmarks as we go. I would just add to that uh, point of clarification. Actually, iStation is an actual progress monitoring tool for benchmarking. The actual assessment is still aligned with what we're doing K through uh, 10th grade, which is the MAP assessment. So when you transition from pre-K to kindergarten, you're still receiving a progress monitoring, but it's just with Achieve 3000 and iReady. So we still have results that's longitudinal from kindergarten up until third grade. The big focus is how do we close the gap from first grade, normally around the fifth month, is when we start seeing the academic gap. But we really gotta make it more standards-based. So go away from just being skill-based to true standards-based because that's what you're being measured in when you get to third grade. Board member Love. So the um, iStation data that we have it's 74%. Uh, is this the first year that we're monitoring the I station? I mean, the pre K data, comparing it to our kindergartners who are ready? Last year was the first year that we were able to actually track those students. Previously, uh, our children were not implemented, in, were not put into power school, and so we weren't always able to track our children. Last year was the first year that we were able to put our children in in pre-K and then track where they were in actual kindergarten. Okay, um, don't quote me on this, but I'm gonna piggyback off of what Board Member Wood stated, um, dealing with the I station um, and the MAP test. Um, I'm kind of confused on how we're we have two different tests, but we're saying that the children leave pre-K at a certain level, and then when we test them in kindergarten on a different test, they're still, I mean, they're, they're still improving. So if we look, go back to bullet two, 
My station only concentrates on letter knowledge, vocabulary, things as we think of as foundational literacy schools mm -hmm. skills. If you look at the fall map assessment and that RIT score of 141, that particular assessment has everything. Okay. And so that's how we can determine when our children showed up in kindergarten last year, they came in at 49% of them came in kindergarten, what we would think of as kindergarten ready, based on a full battery of assessments. Okay. And Superintendent, the test that our kindergartners are taking, well, the assessment that our kindergartners are taking now, what is that, uh, that assessment is based on what? Uh, being in kindergarten five months, being in kindergarten for a whole year, or what, what level is that assessment on? It is adaptive. Is it? Yeah. it is adaptive. So if they take the assessment in kindergarten second month, then the assessment would come in about kindergarten second month, and then it's adaptive as the months go on. Then the test gets incrementally a little bit harder as children are supposed to gain skills. Yeah, so the actual uh, MAP benchmark assessment, think of it as being given quarterly. So it's mm -hmm. roughly every eight weeks you give the MAP. But it's also based on how well you perform on the first benchmark. So if I'm Antonio Bird, I take the first benchmark, then my second rich score is based on where I should be from the first benchmark up into the second benchmark. So it's going to be adapted just for me, whereas I station is based on what tier group I'm in. If I'm in tier three, I receive X amount of minutes. If I'm tier two, I receive X amount of minutes. And it's based on the intervention where map is benchmarking me based on the standard but where I began in the beginning. Okay, so what about our babies who uh, were never in a pre-K program? That's what I'm, what, where, where do you bring them in at? If they've never been in a pre-K program, uh, when you give them their first assessment, is that pre -K, a pre-K assessment, a kindergarten five months assessment, a kindergarten two months in assessment, where, where because I'm, I'm trying to compare, mm -hmm. I'm trying to make sure that we're, we're all on the same level. So a kid that may have been absent from school that's in kindergarten, uh, one of the first requirements that the state requires the KEI. That's a universal screener. That it shows where you should be in kindergarten first month. But once you take the first map, it'll actually give you a rich score. And it may say that this kid is at a pre-kinder le level. But it then provides you a learning continuum that says in between benchmark one and benchmark two, these are the standards and skills you must focus on in order to close the gap and it keeps the trajectory going from where you scored on the first official benchmark. So it's gonna base it on what you, how you actually perform, and then your learning continuum is based on what you need to do to keep going on the upward trajectory. Okay, so Superintendent, just based on that, um, I don't understand why we don't have teacher aides in the room, because we know we have a high number of children who enter kindergarten not ready because they've never been in the pre-K program or, you know, uh, an excellent daycare center. So you have one teacher um, working with our pre-K students who are ready, and then that same teacher is supposed to work with five-year-olds uh, who are not ready. And you're assessing children, and that assessment is going to go towards the TIM score or TVAs or uh, whether or not they'll receive a bonus or not. So, no, I think you. I think I, we need to take all of that into consideration. And I think too, Ms. Love, that you know, I think we did 50 teachers' assistance in this, this year's budget. But I mean, I certainly more help in the classroom would be helpful. And I think just to uh, Dr. Burr's point, it also highlights, you know, when you guys get inundated with all these questions about testing, he just laid out what the state requires. You start off, you got to give a test, so you can see where kids are. If they score a certain amount. Then they're tier two or tier three. If they're tier three, you gotta give them a test every week to progress monitor them so you can aid to determine whether they have a disability. And, it, and all that, it's the teachers who are in there doing it. So, but also, I also wanna point out even the RTI and all that process, I think it requires, a lot of this stuff requires certified teachers to administer the test. So you take that and you put that on top of the new standards and, the, uh, and all the rest of it, it's a lot. So how many kindergarten vacancies do we have? Or how many, you can, you can send me an email later, because uh, it seems like we need to make sure our kindergarten, uh, those classes are uh, filled with certified teachers.
Board Member Cornell, second time. Yeah, in response to uh, teachers' aides, uh, I have talked with uh, Mr. Johnson and the superintendent about a, a way of reconfiguring classes and adding aides really at 50 cents on the dollar and, and enhancing the classroom. We actually literally have classrooms where the older girls are doing better than the younger boys and the kids who do have that half million words at home are doing better than the ones that don't and so essentially we have third grade classes with second and fourth grade st students and so what we have is we have this whole variety that really recreates the one room classroom i mean the one room school and these teachers whether they have 20 kids or 24 kids need a teacher's aid especially with the evaluations that we are, we're having to perform. So anyway, I think we ought to look at that. Board Member Woods. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. I just want to uh, bring attention to the fact that since we are discussing early childhood and the programs and, the, uh, and highlights there, uh, that we should commend the district, uh, particularly uh, you, Dr. McClendon, and the great work you guys have done. So um, since... Um, since I know Mr. Orgel has to be out of here by 7, I had to conclude my, uh, my remarks to say that uh, uh, you guys are doing a fantastic job. Keep up the great work. Thanks. I don't see any more questions. Um, and now we get to go to the first staff action item, the Head Start funding application. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The first one is just that the $23.2 uh, million Head Start funding application. I think that this has been reviewed with you all and also reviewed with the Policy Council. Next, we move to item 7 to seeing no questions, the pre-K grant. This is the uh, grant we receive every year from the state. I think it's right at $10 million. And I think this year, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. McClendon, I think we it was a little more competitive this year. Uh, and uh, we were awarded these dollars to fund our pre-K classes. Next item, 7.3, Teach Stone Training LLC Software and Products for Early Childhood. I think 7.3 and 7.4 are iStation um, licenses and some PD, and I think all this is required by the Head Start grant and is paid for out of the Head Start grant. And I think it's been the Policy Council. I see no questions. Um, I will at least give board members a chance on 7.4. And without without questions, we'll move to 7.5 Shelby County Government Board of Commissioners grant award to early childhood. 7.5 is a grant that we receive. Uh, I think this may be the last year. Next year, yeah, from uh, the the Shelby County Commission for uh, 1.8 million dollars to fund uh, several um, pre-K classrooms. Board Member Orgel. Was that an agreement we took over the Head Start? Which one, though? The, the last one. The, um, the thing about the computers. No, this one. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, this is actually, if you recall, Mr. Orgel, um, um, Mayor Luttrell um, about three years ago committed to funding, I think it's around 30 classrooms uh shelby county i think some in millington and some in um, uh, the asd and so that's separate from apart from that but it wasn't part of our um went around our it's not part of our maintenance of effort it was no. separate it was a grant yeah so they, yeah exactly they, they get they give it over to a foundation or something and they fund the classes gotcha um, seeing no questions, we'll move to the 7 6. I doubt that uh, the superintendent may have a virtual schools presentation. That will be as, um, as well received as the previous uh, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so 7 uh, 6 and 7 7, um, as the board knows, we just finished up a three year pilot program, I think, with 19 schools. Uh, doing some blended learning and we uh, obviously had some mixed results 
what happened after we pulled them out of the schools, we had several schools who asked if they could continue on. So what they've been doing is uh, there's a free subscription that they've been using and they really want to use it in schools. And one of the things we looked at was their usage rate because what we found out, out from our pilot was that the main thing that held folks back was people were afraid to let kids take the devices home. And then, kid, and then schools felt like they just didn't have enough time to really use the use the uh, devices in the class. So uh, schools have asked to use this. They had high usage rate. Uh, there's not the big cost because, as you as the board knows, we've actually already purchased uh, computers for these schools. So it's really just for the license for the uh, curriculum and some professional development. So I'm going to ask uh, if the board uh, will indulge us for a few minutes, just a really quick uh, presentation around this request. Good evening, board members. This purchase represents the continuation and professional development of the McGraw-Hill software for the eight blended learning schools. Um, the software includes My Math and Reading Wonders for the elementary schools and Alex and the Study University for the high schools. The professional development includes the same in-class um, embedded professional development where teachers are coached by the McGraw-Hill um, coaches um, that they have received for the last two years. The participating schools that are participating in this blended learning um, are Cherokee Elementary, uh, Douglas K-8, East High, Levi Elementary, Hamilton Middle, Maxine Smith Steam Academy, Middle College High, and South Wayne High. Um, these schools were chosen because they all averaged above 85% in device usage and software implementation. They also had strong principal, teacher, student, and parent and guardian desire to use um, the devices and the software. And we also had high teacher willingness to uh, uh, archive resources for use by all SES teachers, those outside of the blended and learning schools. Um, the impact of the delay, if we do not receive it, would be that, as the superintendent stated, that right now the schools are using a free trial access of the software. Um, so without the approval of the license, this, um, these licenses will allow the district to accurately track participation and receive data reports from the such software and the students access the full capabilities of each of the programs. The, the support that, we're re, that will be received through uh, the McGraw-Hill contract, of course, the in-class professional development that I discussed earlier, principals and teachers were tailored plans and individual needs to their prospective populations and those said persons will adhere to that their needs, the support of teachers using the non McGraw here source us uh, resources will be coordinated by the cross cross functional team that include professional development of virtual schools and instructional technology team. We also will include professional development for the just for fun classes that will be available for all teachers in the district, whether they're blended learning or not. Um, the Just for Fun courses will be made available to all students. However, all courses begin on a third grade level and span through high school. The information technology uh, is also working with us through challenges with power school that are resulting in incorrect data reports. Within this, with this, we will be able to um, adequately sync with power school if we get the contract. Um, also, in preparation to send the devices home, teachers um, have had to remove power cords from the charging carts so, so students can power up their devices at home. So, and also, Human Resources is in the process of posting eight positions that will allow our office, the Office of Virtual Learning, to better support the teachers and students. Are there any questions? Board Member Ava. 
Superintendent, um, is there data to talk about the gains that these schools who use a blended learning may have received versus those that did not? Dr. Griffin, Dr. Bird. That are already high performing. Yep, so um, last year we had schools that continued to pilot the blended learning. And on average, blended learning schools from fall to spring was at 57.2% and non-blended learning schools were 52.5. Um, that's in reading. Also in math, you had non-blended learning schools at 53.6 and blended learning schools at 58.1. So it's a 4.7 in ELA and a 4.5% difference between blended learning and non-blended learning schools on last school year. But, but I think too, Ms. Avery, like we don't want to oversell it, right? We're not, we, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think that, that there, there were certainly uh, some schools that implemented with Fidelity that, that did, but, but there were some that struggled along that didn't do so great. I think the, the key for this for me was, was the request from the schools and the parents and the fact that they had a track record of actually using and implementing. I mean, somewhere like Maxine Smith, they weren't afraid to send the devices home on day one. They killed it. Somewhere like Levi, you know, actually did a really good job of implementing and did a really good job. But then there were also schools that, you know, for a number of reasons, even to try to do it every day, didn't you know get the results that we wanted so that's accurate but I don't want to you know oversell it <laughs> next I have board member Cornell yeah I appreciate the superintendent's analysis uh, of course if you're going to be tested on a computer the fact that you're very proficient on a computer is going to help you with the test but my con my emphasis is would be like with that smarty ant uh, didn't didn't teachers and principals and whatnot look at that and recommend recommend that so at what point will teachers and principals say we're ready for this or we'd like to expand this will there be another point at which more of these go out based on teacher recommendations or principal recommendations in regard to blended learning I think like superintendent just um, talked about is really um, it still really is where we're trying to measure what's actually successful with blended learning. So I would venture to say I wouldn't want to jump too fast and try to bring this to scale because these schools are really trying to perfect actually doing blended learning in the intended manner. Okay, thank you. Seeing no more questions, I guess we're on 7.6, um, um, and that's McGraw-Hill. McGraw um, digital curriculum for blended, blended learning. So, yeah, that's that was from Ms. Carl. That's that's the uh, the okay. curriculum licenses itself. And, and does that include seven two, seven seven? I mean, it's, yes. Well, seven six is the license, and then the seven seven is the professional development. All righty. Um, so I don't see any more questions on either of the two. So we'll move to seven eight. This is Mr. Orgel's favorite Yes, I was going to say, but, but I'm going to tell him that it makes it easier for kids to get loans, um, you know, um, scholarships and things like that if we are uh, continue to be accredited. Oh, uh, Mr. Orgel has a question. For the sixth straight I mean, year. I'm sorry, board member Orgel. Will you call me whatever? The, um, no, I don't. Give me the, the opportunity. So I asked for the sixth straight year. Can we at least get a discount? Or is it done per student, or how do you do it? Mr. Wyatt. That's the way I feel about it, too. <laughs> it's a flat fee per school. Oh, it's not per pupil or anything? No, it's a flat fee per school. Really? Mm hmm You mean for the number of schools we have for for each school right so like Whitehaven White Station yep. Bolton it's Trevor. nine nine hundred dollars per school it's not cell towers so we could yes. buy in school we could save do we pay for the charters too we do because this is a district-wide process that includes every school and every school has to go through it in order for us to have our district-wide accreditation what about the ASD we do not pay for the ASD. Do the charters reimburse us? They do not. Have we asked? That was Kevin's question. 
Because uh, it benefits everybody. I mean, that's just a. Yeah, it's. I'm not aware of us having asked, um, but it's something we can certainly look into. Because I guess if 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 are we saying, Mr. White, if like say some charters said they're not gonna, you know, they don't want to be accredited. If they couldn't be accredited, then the whole district couldn't be accredited. Yeah, it would jeopardize the whole district's accreditation, and that's part of the reason we pay for it. But I guess, but but could, but could we also, you know, withhold or you know say as part of the process that I mean it's it's a service that we have to pay for each school so it means that's something let me ask i'm gonna ask mr johnson because i'm sure he he doesn't sit well with him so can can we can we reach out and um look into that and bring something back and see if we can get a commitment from the charters to to pay the 900 dollars? i think it's worthwhile okay i don't know how you let that get by you as good as you yeah, are <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> i think it's worthwhile can we have a report on that next week as part of uh not putting this on the consent agenda. Just, I just want to know what we come up with. Okay. I think that's only fair to share that cost. And and um, I'm not going to say what Mr. Woods said, but I'll I'll clean it up. But um, someone should maybe read the fine print of the accreditation and, and see if that really applies to the to the charters not wanting to be accredited because we don't have any control over the charters. Per se, other than we can, we can revoke a charter. I don't, I'm trying to understand what if it's state chartered, and which we then have no control over it. I, I'm trying to understand why they get um, included with us. It, it, it's because we've chosen a district-wide accreditation process, which includes every school we have in our district. You could do school by school, but then the whole district would not be accredited, just individual schools would be accredited. And it's it's more expensive to do the school by school. We actually get savings doing it as an entire district. I thought it was $900 a school. It is under a district-wide accreditation process. Uh, how much is it otherwise? I don't know. I'd have to find out what their current fee is for doing the individual schools. We'll dig into it and have a report. And also, I just while we're talking about Mr. Johnson, I forgot to mention my report, a little out of order, but Lynn has been nominated as uh, the CFO of the year by the Memphis Business Journal, one of the finalists. I just want to give Lynn that shout out. Right. My second time. I have other lights. Oh. oh I'll pop. Um, <laughs> board member uh, Bibbs. Um, really, this question is for Billy, um, but I, I do want to uh, just say that it's um, because we do seem to have this conversation every year. This uh, is a hot topic for and then his seatmate over there, Kevin, um, seemed to get together about this. But I do want to have a question. Last year, what was the amount? I'm trying to recall as I've, since I've been on board now going into my fourth year. Has this number gone down or has it been kind of around the same? For some reason, I kind of remember 200 something thousand. I'm going to have to uh, research what last year's amount was. I okay. apologize. I just don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. I think that that's helpful for us to have that as sure. well because, and I could be wrong, but if for some reason I'm rec recalling a number that was a little bit higher and each year it seems to have gone down a little bit every year. So I think that's um, beneficial for us to keep as a point of reference as well. Next, we have board member Woods. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Lynn, the first thing I'll say is that uh, I think we can contractually, since we contract with each uh, charter school, I think we can have within our in the contracts, uh, Superintendent, uh, that every school will be required to be certified. So either part of their application fee um, or uh, through their contractual obligation that they have to uh, participate and fund uh, the certification process so I think we should we ought to look into that um, especially with the growing number of charters you know that's a thousand dollars roughly a thousand dollars per school uh, amortized over multiple years that's a substantial uh, cost I think that the district just for the sake of being certified I don't know again we often say it's that putting ourselves at risk but so is throwing out a hundred grand uh, is also risky 
Um, the second thing I'll say is, is this the only certifying uh, entity or organization uh, that, that do this work? And are they hiring? Because that's a pretty sweet gig if they're the only people doing it. Sorry. Sorry, Madam Jones. There, there are other accrediting bodies in the U.S. Um, this is the one that's formerly known as the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools that um, primarily does the southeast area, but there are other accrediting body, bodies in the U.S. So we don't bid out the process, superintendent, we just pick whichever one we want to be certified by? I think that's accurate. That's correct? Yes. Okay. Probably want some information on that next week on why you picked that one. But thank you. Um, and before I recognize Board Member Orgel, uh, I have one year left on my current term, and if I'm reelected, I have four more years. Could we investigate a five-year contract so it won't come back? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I'll let Mr. Orgel ask his second question. No, I just wanted to know if Lynn, after missing this on the charter schools, is still under consideration for that Memphis Business Journal Award. That's all. <laughs> Point to mention is that you know serving on the um, charter school compact, leading that group, um, we had a discussion around sh shared services, and there was a willingness from charter schools to contribute to a variety of things. So I do think it's worthwhile um, presenting them with this because it also benefits them, and they may be more than happy to share in that cost. And also we benefit because we have some very high performing charters and we benefit from sure. having them part of the process. So. Board Member Bibbs. I just want to gently remind Billy that also the importance of accreditation is that so our students when they graduate and are applying for colleges that they come from an accredited school district. So just a reminder point because we seem to have this conversation every year. Uh, thank you. We'll have to dock him for that. Um, so I, th I think we're ready to move on. Uh, any more questions going once, twice? Uh, okay, we can move to 7-9 short-term, long-term disability insurance. Thank you. I think that Ms. Smallman presented this in a different form. I think it's, and there was a lot of concern. I think initially you guys may have even heard some, some, some pushback from constituents around what we initially wanted to do was make this our um, – short-term, long-term policy, and then for employees who have services through other providers, uh, not allow those providers to do, um, not direct deposit, but what's payroll deduction. So after going back and speaking, you know, with the uh, successful vendor, they have decided they're, they're not going to raise the rate because of that. So uh, essentially, uh, this is just if, if employees want short-term or long-term disability, uh, through the district, they can pay for it, um, and uh, it. I note that it is substantially less expensive through this provider than it is through with some of the other outside vendors. But um, with that, we'll answer any questions. Board Member Cornell. Um, my question is: um, If someone already has disability insurance and it's payroll deducted, they can continue to have it payroll deducted. Absolutely. And I know this might sound unusual, but if someone wants to buy from this point forward disability, is it, this the only one that's payroll deducted? No, they can, the they can still payroll deduct the other ones payroll, too. Okay. Yeah. And so if, for example, the I think the State Employees Association had several benefits. So if a teacher's association wants to offer something, I don't want to be presupposing I, the MOU, but conceivably they could request and might be allowed to payroll the top. That's that, correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Next, we'll move to seven. Oh. Okay. Uh, Board Member Raven. So uh, in the decision for the, this was for the short-term disability, we decided to, the recommendation from the district is the MetLife. That's correct. Okay. And the, and the scoring of this particular, of these two, 
in the performance guarantees section where it was a 10, a 9, and a 4. I was just a little bit curious about how, what the discrepancy between those two, between those scores, like for that particular metric. Ms. Smalley, have that or, or just? I do have the metric. Um, do you mind repeating your question? I was looking for the actual scorecard. Sure. On the scorecard, it has under the performance guarantees, the difference between scoring is a 10, a 9, and a 4. And so that's a huge discrepancy from the first, the top two versus the third. So I was just trying to get some understanding about those particular points. Um, I think I can probably follow up with you on that information. Normally, the performance guarantees um, discuss the amount of fees that are at risk if the if the selected vendor doesn't perform in a certain manner, or they don't um, adhere to the outline um, performance metrics that are in place. So normally, when you see a vendor that scores low, um, they were not willing to put um, a substantial portion of their fees at risk. But I can get the exact details for you on that. Okay. One. I just wonder because the, the the two top vendors, the score between the two and the one is just, it's so slight in what you got as the final score for these two. Yes, ma'am. I'll be more than happy to confirm that information. But in, in most instances, when you see this variation, it's because certain vendors weren't willing to put as much at risk in terms of their fees and potential earnings from the, the um, program. A percentage of their fees? which it comes back to the district or, or a percentage of their fees that's added on to the cost for the employee? So um, normally when a performance guarantee isn't met, they will shave off that portion from the bill that they send to us. So essentially the district would say, but since these are these, um, these two benefits are 100% employee paid, mm -hmm. any savings from a performance guarantee will go straight back to the employee. Okay. Board Member Bibbs. So my uh, question is similar. When you say here proposed plan design and you show um, a difference of 10, 7, and 6, um, give me some feedback on the differences in the scores and, and essentially what you were looking for when you said proposed plan design. In the RFP, we have outlined um, the benefits or a framework for benefits that we would like for the vendors to be able to offer. Um, particularly with some of your short-term and long-term disability plans, they have very standard plans that maybe are not as flexible, so you have to um, adhere to whatever their standard program is. So when we're looking for um, these types of things as we're rating the vendors, we're looking for the vendor that most closely presented a plan that were that was outlined in our requirements. Okay, so what did you outline? Um, we can get you those exact details. For the benefit program, there are always, um, the, the, de the benefit details are very intricate, so we can definitely get you those um, various categories. But like what, for example, what we would ask is for the vendor to maybe quote a benefit based on a 60% income replacement program um, in addition to a 66% income replacement program for these various benefits. So we can get those requirements that were outlined for you. And I guess I have to ask the superintendent around, um, this is more around a vendor question. If, if according to what we're saying here, it's a particular vendor which we know that has not been the best for us in the past, how does that weigh into when we make decisions regarding that? Well, I think that um, that really goes to some of the discussion we had earlier today around the procurement process. And, and you know, you, you, can, you can put whatever factors you want to, mm -hmm. you know, as you score. And I think that um, you know, I, I'm not aware of, of anything that's scoring saying them. I mean, if you've done business with us before and there was an issue, mm -hmm. you can get dinged if you've sued us before. Like, you know, those mm -hmm. kinds of things that can go into the, uh, can go into the RIP process. So, uh, that's certainly, I'm sure, something that Ms. Phelan, you know, was talking about today and we'll, we'll take a look at. Definitely. I would love to make sure that we include that because uh, I do have concerns around this recommendation based on, on that alone. And I think, too, I mean, I, just the vendor given some stuff we had in the past right. I had some concerns too but I think that because this is a totally voluntary 
if employee wants it or not and they pay for it I think and the, and the fact is I mean it's still almost 40 percent less expensive than some of the other stuff that they can buy out there too and I just think it just gives our employees just one more choice if they want to exercise it. Board Member Love. Chief Smalls, um, under the conclusion, it says the contract is for three years and premiums cannot go higher unless enrollment drops below 25% of eligible employees. So what, break that down to me. So if the enrollment drops, how much more would this contract be? Um, I don't have that exact information at, in terms of um, what the increase would be, but I will say like this is, a, as many of our benefit contracts, there's not a specific contract. There is normally just an, a, an evidence of coverage or a plan document with associated rate guarantees. And so those rate guarantees are in place, but at any time, as long as we provide a 30 day notice, we can terminate the, the, the contract or the agreement with the provider but I can get that escalated scale if um, the enrollment drops, what they would be um, asking for in terms of an increase to the premium for employees. Okay, and I too have a, uh, just a concern with, uh, with MetLife because this is the same, is this the same insurance company that told us we would have a 700 increase in death um, last year? 700% increase in death? This is, this is the same organization, uh, MetLife, but this is a separate line of business. And I will say, um, I, you know, and I know that conversation is really fresh on everyone's mind, minds, but I think at that particular point, they, they had the business and that was a renewal situation. And I experience was um, unfortunately very, very bad or poor in terms of our loss ratio. When, so when you have a six or 700% loss ratio in terms of the number of um, deaths that our organization had, had experienced in a renewal situation, they were quoting a rate. Um, when we took that out to bid again for the second time and organizations, other competing organizations were able to see what we were being charged, that's how they were able to come in and set a lower rate, which in the end it did benefit the organization. But I do think we had a very, um, we had a very diverse RFP committee that included representation from all components of the organization, our union partners, um, some of the uh, representatives from our other associations, even though that we don't have an MOU with those associations, they were still represented here. And this was the recommendation of that group. Um, I have one question. I mean, uh, I see um, the third one um, from the general minimum requirements and, and the category is general. And that sort of sounds like a miscellaneous and there was a difference in scores. So I was just curious, what does general encompass? On the uh, scorecard, some, of, uh, some examples of the general requirements were um, the business tenure, like how long the organization had been in existence, um, the type of clinical and case management programs that they offer as a standard offering in their RFP, um, their technology systems, would they be, um, uh, would they have the ability to interface seamlessly with some of our technology platforms? So it's some of the, the general things that you would expect the vendor to be able to um, provide in terms of the benefit. Thank you. And uh, board member Avent, the second time. Oh. Shouldn't have whispered it to the superintendent, but I was saying the volatility. I think Ms. Love stated the same comment with what we had, um, and Ms. Smalls explained it, but I guess I, that was my same concern with what we had in volatility with MetLife. It's, it is very fresh, very. Um, second time board member Bibbs. Thank you, Chair. So I, uh, because um, Chief Small just brought this up regarding technology. So you're saying that MetLife outscored the other people regarding technology. Was that something that they have in person and they showed it to you or was it a possibility of a maybe? Uh, no, and I will just say in the, in the grand scheme of things for the scoring, the general requirements um, was a total of 15% in terms of the weight. So like the technology platform or system that they, that they were able to offer is just one component of those of that 15% requirement. 
And um, I think when we're talking about the technology system and platforms, it's just the ability that your organization would be, a, and ability and support that your organization will be able to offer to us in terms of, for example, electronic enrollment file feeds so that we don't have to hand key a lot of this information. Um, their willingness to work with any vendor that we may have for our online benefit enrollment platform to ensure like a seamless implementation mm -hmm. and enrollment process for our um, employees. Okay, thank you for the explanation. But I guess my question more so is they're saying that when they did the presentation, did they show you that or were they giving you a maybe? Like we will if we get the contract. Or did the other companies say, hey, we already have it in hand. We're ready to roll present day. Let me ask Ms. Um, let me ask Ms. Poindexter to confirm. Uh, the three finalists in and they all did presentations of their uh, technology that they offered. So they did do, uh, for the committee, they did come on site to do that uh, presentation. And they did. I think it, they demoed their platform, but uh, additionally one thing that, like I said, that we always look for is their ability to be able to integrate um, with our platforms and provide us with the tools and resources to make the administration of the program easier so that we're not having to manually key and deal with paper, um, mm -hmm. which we've moved to a completely online, paperless environment for our benefits enrollment. Yeah. Thank you. Board, board Member Love, second time. Uh, two more questions. In the discussion background, um, so you're going to auto enroll all employees or just the current ones who are already on the SCS long term disability plan? Um, so the auto enroll would apply to all eligible employees, but there is also an opt out. Uh, and Ms. Poindex and I have already kind of discussed how we will monitor this and um, do a lot of do follow up or the necessary follow up with employees to ensure that they actually want the benefit that they are aware of it particularly as we roll out the program because that is new um, in the past we have had programs where it was an opt out um, mm -hmm. an opt out provision um, and I think as long as we are able to get the reports that we need we're able to help employees make the right decision and oftentimes able to accommodate and refund premiums where there were any any mishaps or any concerns related to um, I didn't want this program, I forgot to opt out, we were always able to accommodate those types of situations and scenarios. Okay, and last question, uh, bullet point number two, um, where it says the annual cost of three million um, and then the long-term disability of five million. They said this is based on if all 11,000 eligible employees enroll. So is this is this what you were suggesting or your department or is this what um, meant is or is this what the insurance company no is I this think what they suggest this is just I think as part of the RFP process oh, so we have to we calculate the maximum value of the contract so <laughs> this maximum value is based on if all employees were to enroll in the contract and I think that's just the procurement and contracting process RFP to state contract. the maximum value of the contract okay board member Cornell is this your first time well <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe you. This, we're giving you a second time. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, so if I'm if I'm an employee now and I'm enrolled in Unum through payroll deduction, then I can stay enrolled in Unum. And, yes, sir. That's correct. So initially, we did present an um, a, 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 an option. Um, where we were no longer going to payroll deduct if an employee participated in the individual plans that they now have available through, um, I think it's three different vendors. But um, after reconsidering that, employees will still be able to keep what they have. We will continue to payroll deduct for that. They will also have the ability to roll in this insurance program, but this is why um, we 
want to closely monitor that and make sure employees are educated so that a they're not overinsured and b that you know they're not you know spending money in areas where they don't need to so we do have um, a, a way to set up reports that we're able to catch that on the front end and be able to communicate with employees and so if you automatically enroll you're not going to be automatically kicking them off but they're no doing. sir okay and then uh mercer is the is the company that developed and bid the they helped us facilitate the rfp um and keep in mind this has been going on for quite some time um i think <laughs> so that's why they, they're still in the picture in terms of helping us um through this particular rfp process but, but just so we know how it works they get a percentage do they get a do they get a fee for developing and then a percentage i'm it, they, it may not be a lot. I don't know. I just I'm wondering where, at what point they come in. Mercer is paid through commissions, but I, there were not any commissions built into this particular um, this particular benefit for Mercer's fees. They normally develop a scope of work uh, each year, and it's a flat amount. And what we do is we calculate that, um, and and they're paid via commissions primarily through the health plan um, vendor and i think also through the life insurance vendor those are the two vendors um, that pay the commission to mercer traditionally that fee um, has been about three hundred thousand dollars per year and it's paid strictly through commissions uh, i have one last question I, I know with one of the vendors there was a huge uh, disparity in technology systems were they using refurbished computers or stone tablets um, I will. I, I did not attend the, the demo session. Um, I can ask Ms. Um, Poindexter to maybe talk about what the big discrepancy was in terms of how the team or the RP committee rated the vendor who presented that information. This is not where, okay. Uh, mostly the committee rated the uh, vendors based on uh, the technology as far as if they had mobile apps that employees could use um, and if employees could actually go to their site, you know, uh, and make enrollments, that type thing. But um, they actually uh, showed us a demo of what employees could do. So um, that was basically it. Oh, the, uh, the reason why uh, standard was so low is because they didn't really have the um, technology as far as um, employees being able to, you know, uh, pull up information about their claims using their uh, cell phone or, or whatever mobile device that they have. And uh, everything was still paper with standard. Okay, Lisa graduated from Stone. That that's an, an, was enough information for me. Yes. Okay, thank you. I guess seeing no more questions, and since we're not giving uh, uh, Board Member Cornell a second question, I think we can move on to 710 Parent Engagement Services. I think just as a related, when Ms. Carl, I really want to, and I'll circle back with you to. I think that the team has done a really good job of trying to make sure that we hold the uh, health insurance premiums steady this year. And I think we wanted to share some different plan design stuff with the board early. So we'd love to do a budget and finance meeting, committee meeting at the board's pleasure so we can share those with you guys as we think about the next year's insurance plan. So just want to raise that. Thank you. Um, 710 is uh, for uh, APPT, I know the board is very familiar with uh, the work they're doing around our parent engagement. And I think it expands to uh, how many more schools? It expands to 15 schools. Um, and that's what that's for. I, I don't see any more questions, but um, so if, if, can you tell me what APTT stands for? Because I, I think we saw a presentation in and my question is, do we have any data that supports expanding this? APTT stands for Academic Parent Teacher Teams, and I'm happy to, re 
to provide with um, the report from last year, which was presented at one of the academic committee meetings, but I'm happy to share it again. Well, you're, yes, that'd be just great, or just, you know, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, that's the only question, 7.11 7 uh, 7 or 7.11, uh, Mid-South Communications Foundation, radio tower lease. Yes, this is for the tower lease for our radio station um, to broadcast 88.5. I think it's um, five years at $34,000 a year. Board Member Orgel. Aisha, did I ask some questions about this? You did, Mr. Orgel. I think just a point of clarification this we're leasing the tower so we can transmit our signal. We're not transmitting, we're not leasing for cell phones or any other purposes. I think there was a confusion there in one of your questions. Not for me. Okay. No, I apologize no, then. I, th I actually understand the difference. The um, <laughs> so um, when's it's for a five-year lease, mm -hmm. and um, is the lease up already? Because it. Uh, Ms. Everson, expired? can you clarify the data when the lease is up? Yes, the the lease is up. Gotcha. Do we have to sign a lease for five years? No, we don't. We can go year by year. It was recommended that we do five years so that it wouldn't change. We're making amendments every single year. Mm -hmm. But if needed, we can do yearly. Making amendments meaning what? Um, we added additional space. We moved spaces, so we made an amendment this year. Um, the price adjusted slightly, which is also on that document. I saw that. And um, so now the price has gone up a, a little bit because we're in a new space and have additional uh, equipment out there. Um, so we were looking at doing a five-year lease to hold it and so we don't have to make uh, renew every single year since we had planned on being there. Was, th was this off the air for a while? Or was the t what was off the air for a while? The TV or the radio? Um, a few so. years back. Oh, yeah. Chief Powers? Mm-hmm. A few years back, it got uh, hit by lightning or something. There was a major power outage that took the that uh, fried the equipment and had it down for uh, several weeks. Yes, sir. Gotcha. Um, can you send me, Superintendent, the the document before we sign it? Sure. And I, I would also recommend that we do it for a one-year lease. Okay. And. Um, and see what happens after that. But I'd like to look at the document cool. if, I, if I could. Sure. And, um, and I'm happy to help any way I could. That's good. So does anybody listen to, do we know, do we do any data on who listens to the radio station? Yeah. I we, didn't ask yes. if you yeah. listen to it. I said, do we do yeah. any, do we have any data? Do people listen to the radio station? We do. And last I'm not, year, I'm not advocating we get rid of it. I was just asking, do we know the people? We listening? do. And last year, uh, we increased our listenership by 14%. So we're happy to provide that data as well. Which is, don't they do that by points? <laughs> mm -hmm. so, yeah. So, so we can provide a full report. Happy to email that. Yeah. Well, what do you have to the board? Just tell the, maybe next week, just let the board know. We'll take it sure. off consent. Okay. Just, I, I just want to hear it's good. It's nice. Yeah. To hear. And it's part of our strategic goals for this year. We want to increase, continue to increase listenership um, as well as viewership the, in our The TV board station. may or may not know it, but I was talking to the wonderful people back here that work in this small room without air conditioning and <laughs> that, that broadcast for us. And uh, they broadcast the Southern Heritage Classic. And I think Mr. Yes, Best did. Uh, did. might have been part of that as well back there. I see him in another yes, unair conditioned room. So that, that's pretty impressive. So anyway, I'd just Thank like you. to hear about it next week. And I also like to look at the lease because uh, I'm in that business, I understand it. So I would be happy to help you guys. We'll send okay. that your way. Thank you. Just to give you some insight, he told me he does better work in a room without air conditioning. <laughs> uh, board Member Cornell. I do listen to the station, but I wish we had some stickers. You know, radio stations have stickers. I just wish we had stickers we could put on cars and get, get more of the word out. Call it like the the best station, you know, or something. Also, if we could get the TV 
the TV station in our office. That'd be great too. Mm. Do you guys have cable up there? Are you, okay, we'll take care of it. We get PBS. We get PBS really well, and we get the Hispanic station, which is very interesting. But I don't know what they're saying. We'll make sure we take care of the, the, the cable this week. <laughs> We're going to skip you the next item, okay? Uh, board member Love. Just for some uh, context around board member Orgel, um, I listen to 88.52. Um, he's also on Facebook. Um, and if we're going to talk about the Southern Heritage Classic, we did have the livest uh, booth at the Classic. At the Tigers one? If, if we're just going to talk about it. They lost. You know, Shelby County Schools, we had the livest booth. I mean, we had everybody. I mean, yeah. we yeah. Way to go. And we broadcast football games every week, too. I think three last week. Yeah. We know that. I know you know about it. I have someone in front of you, M Board Member Bibbs. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, because Ms. Love just took my thunder, I just, <laughs> just had to since it was a great segue to talk about. Just really proud of SES and how we handle the Southern Heritage Classic. I think um, Ms. Love and I were out there pretty much the whole time. She probably stayed a little bit later than I did, but quite frankly, I am super proud of Shelby County Schools when it comes to how we partner with the community around events that matter to our students and to our families. Without a doubt, we were the best at the Southern Heritage Classic. So I uh, definitely wanted to give uh, hands, claps to John Best and also to the communications team under Chief Powers, making sure that we were uh, definitely a strong presence during that time. Thanks again. Um, Board Member Cornell. Um, second time. Yeah, this is your second time, so I'm gonna take away 7.15 for your comments, I, so go ahead. I promise not to make you laugh. Uh, I will not try that. What I wanna say something that's very serious. I think it is incredible that people from all over the country and all around the world who couldn't get here for their for graduations were able to. We there's no telling how many kids from other countries where the, they watched the graduation from other countries and so I want to commend the station for making sure that our graduations went worldwide and thousands and thousands of people could see them. Thank you. Um, Item 7, 12, um, Memphis Area Transit Authority, Matt of Bus Cards. This is um, for primarily our kids who attend alternative schools, um, of which we don't do regular transportation, uh, so that they can get to the schools. And it's with um, a partnership we have through uh, MATA, or with MATA. Board Member Woods. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, Superintendent, I will use this opportunity since uh, we're discussing MATA to see if uh, uh, you or anyone from uh, your operations team could update us on um, the conversation related to MATA and them wanting to supplement uh, transportation uh, for the district. Sure. So, um, last week we had a meeting. Um, the CEO and several members of the MATA team came to meet with us, and the dialogue was in two areas. One was you know, an interest on MATA's uh, behalf to talk about potentially um, providing formal bus service to our schools, you know, in lieu of our uh, bus program. And it, they explained it to us as, you know, if they were to pursue that type of activity, they would be obviated for their funding because they're federally funded. So that, that kind of took that item off the table. And then the second area was um, to try to do a pilot program at East High School um, to try, to, because of the STEM program, to try to set up some um, bus activity that transports children home after that program because we don't provide buses after that program. So we agreed to pilot that as a program. Right, and I appreciate that, uh, that update. I also had um, uh, sent an email, uh, just uh, more of a suggestion uh, to the superintendent uh, early on, uh, and obviously uh, you guys uh, can do what you will with it, but 
you know, I, I think when we, we were in a meeting um, yesterday, a workforce related meeting, and we look at what are barriers to young people going to work. Uh, and I was surprised that the number one issue is transportation. Uh, so while we th talk a lot about getting kids back and forth to school safely, uh, when we look at over the summer, the, su the summer learning, the drop offs, when we look at our kids' ability to, to go to work or uh, maybe even go to our community centers or go to the pool. I think it's an opportunity, uh, and I'm only mentioning this because we've had conversations about where should we be looking at making additional investments. Uh, I think particularly there's an opportunity to look particularly around our high schools or around kids who uh, indicate that they are uh, working over the summer or they have transportation challenges, uh, that we could extend this type of program if we already contracted with MATA, that there's an opportunity to extend that to other high school uh, students that may, uh, may or may not be interested in uh, extracurricular activities, uh, work-based learning, internships or employment opportunities. Uh, I think it increases the public system ridership uh, and it also may increase this particular population's ability to go to work. Um, we've, we've used this program over the years I know for our alternative school students but we're supplementing now something because we're not doing it. I would like for us to dig deeper and see what, it, what else is possible uh, if we could serve this population uh, in, a, in a meaningful way, particularly when the superintendent has indicated uh, that uh, we're going to be laser focused on uh, uh, career opportunities for this young, young population. And we know that we've heard directly from the students that transportation uh, continue to be a barrier to them going to work. So I just wanted to, to make that pitch. It's not a pitch necessarily from MATA. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you give them Uber vouchers, but uh, if there's an opportunity to support this population and help them go to work, I would like for us to look into it. Sounds good. Thank All you. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next item, 713 Playground Installations of A.B. Hill Elementary, Fox Meadows Elementary, Getwell Elementary, and Bruce Elementary School. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's exactly what this is for. And I believe the Policy Council has um, weighed in on all these um, because it is through Head Start dollars. Item 714 HVAC Replacements Phase 2 at Berkeley Air Elementary. That's exactly what it's for, Mr. Chair, $1.4 million for uh, HVAC uh, replacement and repair. Item 715, interior painting, Bellevue Middle School. That's exactly what it's for, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, interior painting at uh, Bellevue. Just, just reading the title. <laughs> yes. 7.6, produce, direct to school sites for USDA. <laughs> funded school breakfast program, national school lunch program, Head Start afternoon snacks, <coughs> and after school suppers and snacks for November 2017 to February 2018. That's it uh, for the <coughs> snacks for the Head Start program during the time period. Board Member Love. <laughs> so this is only for our Head Start program? That's correct. Okay. Board Member Cornell. Is this, uh, is this the one where we're getting sweet potatoes from Mississippi or lo a little more local grown? Palo I thought I read where Palazzo was getting some sweet potatoes. Yeah, this is more about... Um, Bananas, limes, pineapple spears, red peppers. Those are the ones that can't be purchased in the country. They have to be purchased outside the country. I thought I read where we couldn't we we couldn't purchase it and couldn't find those products inside the country, but we had to we had to go outside, maybe to Mexico or someplace. I thought I read that on the summary. But anyway, I'll. Yeah, oh. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, I'm sorry. This is direct to schools for USDA, and these items are items that must be purchased inside the country, and it is for the entire school district, including the breakfast program, the school lunch program, as well as snacks and after school meals. Are some not able to be purchased inside the country? Yes, sir. And that those are uh, items that would be on the next agenda items. And we are purchasing some things from farms near Memphis. Yes, we are. Okay. And that would be your local bid. Mm -hmm. 
Um, next item, 717, fruits and vegetables items. Fruit, <coughs> fruits and vegetable, vegetable items, November 7th to 2017 to February 2018, local preference. That's correct and goes to exactly what Mr. Cornell just spoke up. Okay, so while he's waiting, we'll move on to 718 for food storage, freezer, and cooler rentals. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is um, in reference to our Central Nutrition Kitchen uh, operation rental of uh, storage freezers. S seeing no lights, we'll move to 719 September 2018 budget amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's posted. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you want to hit the highlights on that? Absolutely. There's really one budget amendment for um, the month of September. It relates to capital. Our capital budget is increasing by about $2.4 million. This is a result of the timing in terms of when we are um, getting paying for reimbursements and when the payments are happening. So our fiscal year is somewhat split um, and we have 60 days to close our books. And based on the timing and of the receipt of those invoices, uh, we need to increase our budget by 2.4. So that's the amount that uh, we did not spend last year that will be applied to this year. Along with that, there are some realignments that are happening within our budget. And I'll highlight two key um, alignments. One is Sheffield High, their um, HVAC um, um, system needs to be updated and we are reallocating unspent funds to support that project and then the second is related to the purchase of a new building for the CNC as well board member Cornell um, a new a new building for the Central Nutrition Center is that like a little building? Uh, so we're not. It's n one hadn't been identified yet. We're just trying to reallocate the dollars, and when we identify a space, we'll bring it back to the board. I think it's just really more of a. You you want to elaborate that? Um, elaborate on that, Beth. So um, when the funds were originally appropriated, it was 5.2 million to fix the roof in Jackson Avenue. And since we're not gonna fix the roof, y'all approved um, surplus for that facility for potential demolition. We have to repurpose those funds for another reason. And so the reason would be once we do identify a building that the board approves, those funds would be used to purchase that building. So we have to reappropriate the dollars because the county approves project uh, pro approves dollars by project and when they approve those funds it was to fix the roof at Jackson Avenue and we're not going to fix that roof so we have to reappropriate those dollars so um, since that won't buy a really really huge building are we are we sort of sitting the money there I think that um, what Chief Johnson's trying to do is reappropriate the dollars so when we do find a property and we bring it to the board for approval, whatever that looks like, we'll talk about it at that point. Okay, because the, I guess the federal government wants to make sure you are putting, putting your money in the right category. <laughs> is that it? I would make one change to that, is that these funds are, are not federal funds. These would be uh, capital funds that are provided by um, Shelby County. Okay, thanks. Board Member Woods. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Superintendent, uh, they did help identify an important question. Uh, with the federal dollars, we know we can't purchase uh, a facility for, um, uh, to support uh, you know, our, our food programs, but we can rent. Uh, could the district, let's just say we identify a facility that uh, not just for food service, but may have multiple usages, could, could the district charge the grant Let's say, say the district owns the building. Could the district charge that grant uh, usage space? So basically, you're basically paying rent back to the district? No. And 
Um, how that would how that would take place is that um, we are provided a direct cost that we charge towards these grant, um, and that uh, I know I talk about how that pays for administrative costs, finance, HR, right. Right. but it also would encompass that as well. Um, so, so you're saying that your rent cost is a part of your uh, your indirect cost, your uh, administrative cost. Yeah, if you if you think about the the total calculation of it, it it, it, it would be a component of that. Okay. All right. Thank you. And so I have a question since there are no more lights. So um, was this sort of the next priority and that's how we identified to spend it on this, this item? The, the, you know, we, we, so we had CIP funds. And so we com we're deciding to commit it to two different things, um, Sheffield yeah. HVAC and, and also the Central Nutrition Center. So yes, yeah, so Sheffield was the next item on the HVAC priority list. And then we couldn't cover it in the other capital, so we pulled it up. Right, and so then, but but, but it, did it have to be on the Central Nutrition Center, or if there were items at another school, or um, is that something we could do later if we decide to, yeah, they're, to they're, move it? They're two completely different things. So Sheffield was reappropriating some dollars that were left over from our project. And we're going to use that money to pay for the Sheffield HVAC improvement. Right. The, the bare reappropriation was specific to CNC, and we still need a solution for CNC. It's still county dollars, capital dollars, but we still need a solution for it. So, so because of the, we, th we think that for urgency reasons or whatever, because we're not comfortable with what we're doing right now, that, that that's the best use That's of. correct. And because okay. um, the system's still distributed around the city, and we still have decentralized it. Mm -hmm. And so w what's the time frame on, on, on what we anticipate? Is, is it this fiscal year, this coming fiscal year, that we intend to ha make a, have a resolution on that? I think so. Okay. Yeah. All right. Because but then if we if something gets pushed out, then we have the ability yep. to reappropriate uh, it for yep. either school yep. or some some other emergency. And we'll bring it to the board um, via the ad hoc facility meeting. Okay, great. Yep, thank you. Um, and then finally, the last item, and I believe it's sponsored by Board Member Love. Did you, what did, what did you oh, get in? Was what was your conduct grade in school? What's that? What was your conduct grade in school? <laughs> Always got an S. <laughs> but what about the people around you? Yes. Yes, what I thought. Yes, stood for sorry. Uh, so the item is an important item. It's uh, eight one, MLK fifty resolution. Board members, this is a resolution. Um, I did tell you guys about last month that I would be bringing forth. I do want to ask if there are other board members that would like to sponsor this with me. Um, your signature, well, I did tell you last month um, that I was bringing this, and I told you exactly what it was for. But uh, so do, uh, do I read this now or do I wait till next week? Just have. Okay. Okay, so board members, please take the time and read over this resolution. I think you will be very pleased. Um, hmm? Oh, at least, okay. Yeah, this is a resolution extending Shelby County School support in collaboration with MLK 50. I'm pretty sure all of you guys know that the National Civil Rights Museum, that they're going to have a year-long ce celebration honoring uh, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I just really wanted Shelby County Schools to be 100% involved in this. If there are any other sponsors that would like to sponsor, uh, Ms. Goins, please get their name so uh, they can be placed on this as well. Thank you. Board Member Orgel. We all might want to do that, as was, would, which would be great. We'd love to co-sponsor it. And as a, a Chairman Call, as part of the Pardon me, what was that last name? Chairman Caldwell. Okay, I thought you were no. speaking Hebrew or something. As part of, that, that'll be tomorrow. I, I'm tomorrow. Jewish, so I mean, I can say that. So anyway, um, uh, you, you, never mind. <laughs> um, to, to get, uh, as part of the MLK 50, I know it's tangential, but tonight we've done that a little bit, but each of the board members really desperately wants to help their schools 
in the um, and and part of the budget uh, process. This is on the MLK 50 it, resolution. It is. It, it is because it had like. This is the last item, and I only have one more meeting. Mr. Orba has a dream. They so <laughs> thank you. And I, no, but I was saying in benefit to all of our schools and our students, to the board, we have a we have funds allocated for us to help our schools, and many of us have schools already asking us for grants to do certain things and the school year if we don't get them in soon some of the needs are going to pass so i was just imploring my fellow board members because i've seen some emails going around from the board office that about a process for dispersing these funds we let we should in short order i don't know we have a meeting it might be december till we do anything i mean i was just going to say we can if if it you're right. <laughs> With that, meeting's adjourned.